Welcome to the Passive Income Through Multifamily Real Estate Podcast, brought to you by Vertical Street Ventures, where we talk to top experts and seasoned investors to help provide clarity and key insights to keep you safe on your journey to financial freedom. Our goal is to help you get educated on how to create passive income for you and your family using real estate as your vehicle. If you enjoy the show, please go to iTunes and leave a rating and a written review to help us grow and reach more listeners. If you're tired of working the nine to five grind, missing too many key moments in your family's lives and looking for a way to be financially free in three years, then listen up. Aspiring real estate investors, I'll give you my exact multifamily playbook that will get you financially free in three. And if it doesn't work for you, you pay nothing. Vertical Street Ventures Multifamily Academy is a hands-on coaching program that teaches you from start to finish how to buy, raise capital, and run multifamily apartment buildings as an active investor. It's designed to accelerate your goals so that you can be financially free in three years. With this program, you'll get group mastermind sessions and office hours with industry experts so that you learn from the best, unlimited one-on-one coaching sessions with our lineup of experienced coaches so you can avoid costly mistakes, be part of a highly motivated, driven, and like-minded group of individuals. It's a built-in ecosystem of other folks motivating each other to reach their goals, attend two in-person training and networking events where we do case studies, bus tours, and build on these relationships to get deals done, and an opportunity to partner on deals with VSV and leverage our resources to get your foot in the door, where we walk you through the entire process from start to finish and partner with you on these deals. How do you know this could work? Our students have worked on over $300 million of assets across the country since joining our program. We've partnered on five deals with our students this year alone, where we walk them through the entire process from acquisitions to asset management. This is an opportunity to get you out of the rat race So visit us at vsvacademy.com to schedule time with us and learn more. Welcome back to the Passive Income Through Multifamily Real Estate Podcast. My name is Peter Pomeroy, and I am your host. Today, we have Alan and Elena Neely with us. Alan and Elena are a husband and wife investment team who have been investing in real estate since 2000. They have deep experience rehabbing and developing properties in Seattle, Washington, However, looking for the most efficient returns on their time and finances, they have grown their business by investing in apartments through syndications. Through their company and over holdings, they currently own over 5,600 units as a general partner and limited partner. Alan and Elena, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's great. It's great to connect um, more deeply. So let's uh, let's jump into it. There's a lot to get into. Maybe you guys could just kind of briefly share your story on how and why you first got into real estate investing and how you built up your net worth and then um, how your investment focus has evolved. Yeah, uh, our backgrounds, we both come from really humble beginnings, had to work really hard for everything we had. And my big goal in life was to become an airline pilot. So I started riding my bike to the airport for flying lessons. I cleaned machine shops and did all kinds of dirty jobs to get money for that. Eventually after, I don't know, it was like in 2000, I got hired at my dream job, Alaska Airlines, which I just loved it. But along the way, every airline I worked for, other captains would say, one day, if you're lucky, you're going to wake up unemployed for six months, you'll be furloughed. If you're really unlucky, the company will go out of business, you'll lose your pension, you'll lose your seniority, you'll you'll have to start over at another airline. So we're always cognizant of at any moment you could lose your job, at any moment, you know, the economy can change. So we we wanted to invest in something. So starting in 2000, we started investing in real estate. We did that BRR thing before it was a thing, really. We'd buy a house, we'd move into it, renovate it, rent it out, refinance it, go buy the next one. And then in about 2005, we started developing townhomes in Seattle, and that kind of just kept growing and growing. So we had a construction company and a property management company, and then she has her her real estate company, her own brokerage. And then in about 2017, we kept everything we built is rental property. So brand new high-end townhomes, basically. And we were looking at it. We couldn't retire on the 
cash flow. So we had to figure out a way to get better cash flow. And Seattle was not landlord friendly at all. So we discovered Texas, started traveling to Texas, meeting people and started investing passively with uh, syndicators. And then some friends of ours said, hey, we'd like to invest too. Can you help us out? So then we became general partners on some deals. All right. And I want to go back to the development piece uh, yeah. in a moment because you guys are so humble. And, and, and the development work you've done is is like, you know, pretty incredible, I think, especially given um, that you've been successful in a challenging, you know, city to be successful in. Yeah. Um, but before we do that, um, so Andover Holdings, what is your business model? And, and what I mean by that, are you sourcing the deals and then just within your own investor group, raising the capital, or are you partnering with, um, you know, local partners and, and maybe just talk to that for a minute? So um, we're kind of doing different scenarios depending on the project. Our goal really is to keep growing our investor community and creating more opportunities uh, for them through education and through different investment projects, depending on what their goals are. Because some of the projects we have are more cash flow oriented for some of the investors who are there at that time of their life. Like we have one of the investors who is sailing in Bahamas through the winter right now. And that's their eventual goal is to invest in the projects which bring cash flow. And then we have some other investors who are still interested to grow their um, NASDAQ and increase their capital. So we have some projects which are built to rent and which are more focused on the creating uh, the asset um, for management later. So you're gonna- Yeah, okay. somebody's knocking at our door. <laughs> It's all right. It happens a lot. So, all right. So then, so it sounds like you're, you have a you know pretty flexible, maybe even opportunistic kind of model where you're able to um, be in markets that you like yeah. product types that, you know, you feel strong about given, you know, you know, where we might be in the cycle and then leverage your own development and investment experience to ensure that those you know investments that you're bringing capital to right. like a run and thought out, you know, correctly. Yeah. All right. So let's talk about markets. So, um, you know, just kind of quickly, I know that you're in Texas and you're have also been in Seattle, you know, Washington, Seattle. Yeah. Um, were there particular reasons why you're, you were in, in, in Texas? Are there other, you know, I think we all probably can understand what those reasons are, but are there other like kind of markets that you see similar to Texas? What, what are your thoughts on markets? Yeah, we really, want landlord and business friendly environments. Uh, there's a lot of growth in those areas. So we look for areas with much higher than average growth in the nation. Uh, Tennessee's that way. We've done some deals in Tennessee. Uh, we're actually involved in some stuff in Cleveland, Ohio, uh, because the Cleveland Clinic is uh, doing a, a huge expansion project uh it'll have twenty thousand new jobs so you know if you build some units across the street from that it's poised pretty well to take advantage of it yeah. right uh but yeah we love texas mainly sure so what i know i know that you've invested in in you know multifamily that you know, class a and new construction class a b and c yeah like talk to us a little bit about like like you know, how that, like your view on investing in those different kind of quality classes or asset classes, if you yeah. will, like might have changed, um, if at all, what like yeah. why one's be maybe better than the other or more yeah. risky or, or, you know, the kind of your thoughts. Yeah. So we basically started with class A because we were building brand new townhomes on like Alki Beach in Seattle, really nice place to have townhomes. And the cash flow is really skinny. So when the, when there's a hiccup in the economy, it it really hurts. Mm -hmm. uh, if you start reducing rent a couple percent, it kind of eats up most of your cash flow. And then with a Class C, it's kind of the opposite. It's highly management intensive, but there's a lot of cash flow, which is a big cushion. But also, if you look at the average tenant, the amount of their pay compared to their rent, it's like 
a huge part of their pay. It all goes to rent. Mm -hmm. So when times are tough, that really gets hit hard too. And we're kind of like settling into B-class properties and B-class neighborhoods, mm -hmm. nice schools. All right. That's so that was kind, kind of what we're focusing on now. Yeah, that's our focus now is looking for that. And and so that that was kind of my follow up question is you know given your outlook on the world today the economy uncertainty um, your thought is to focus in on class B yeah product kind of B areas yeah for the most part yeah for the most part class B uh, good school districts and kind of manageable size asset and also where we can utilize. A great property management company yeah. resources. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's right. like, yeah, cash flow gives you great, you can eat the cash flow. Right. And it's stable, but an appreciation makes you rich. Right. And then it's really hard to find a hybrid, a specific project that does both equally. So you kind of have to pick do you want decent cash flow or? You know, an A-class property should appreciate more, especially if you're doing new construction. Yeah. All right. So, so you know, with that, let's go back and talk, like, talk a little bit more about development and um, and how, like, like kind of, or maybe the why you got into developing these townhomes in Seattle versus leveraging up at that point in time to, you know, four units, you know, like, you know, value add type yeah. stuff. Yeah. Uh, that's a really good question. That's a good question. I think <laughs> most of the benefit we found and we kind of stumbled on that looking for their location terms and expense expendability. Mm -hmm. And we found the kind of a niche um, in the area we lived in, in West Seattle, uh, where zoning allows to put on one lot two to three to four townhomes. The right. last projects we did was eight townhomes. And we are very strong believers on focusing and targeting what you know, and then repeating it right. again. So that strategy really worked with us. Alan's been very great and successful with uh, working through the construction projects that size and created great um, group of the contractors who worked with. So we kind of did that once, were very successful and replicated it quite a few times. Yeah. Um, until he started actually analyzing the cash flow and the numbers and how's the equity is performing. So that's when we started veering into the multifamily. Okay, so to take us through kind of at a high level, a hypothetical development project, and it could be like the townhomes, or you mentioned, I think, mm -hmm. um, the build to rent, whatever scenario you want. And take us through the, maybe the capitalization, like the money, you know, the money comes in, then some stuff happens. And then at some point mm -hmm. the money starts to come out, like what that looks like. Um, so it really depends what your end goal is. For us, we built and we kept those units um, to go past their, um, some builder warranties and uh, laws in place in state of Washington for the new construction. And for us, our kind of our goals were identified always by future, by the long term. So we weren't really into the building and development aspect to build it and sell it right away and keep doing that. So our aspect was more in building a portfolio and the new construction fit on that really well because you have an asset which rents higher and has less management intensive um, requests. And we built, we picked the high-end neighborhoods where we primarily had Amazon, Microsoft, Google tenants. Um, so it's kind of that higher rent um, and higher um, tenant pool availability. So it kind of made it easier to rent out. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like... Um... The um, I mean, there's different like business plans a developer or aspiring yeah. developer might have. One might be to you know build, get it occupied, and then sell. Um, what you guys chose to do is build, get it occupied, and hold. Yeah. Um, and you know maybe you know decide whether or not to try to refinance out. 
Um, but there's different, there's different kind of business plans. And the other thing I'm, I'm hearing is that, um, you know, maybe you were kind of, you were kind of opportunistic in the sense of, we know Seattle, we know Mm -hmm. this area, we know that, you know, these are the uh, employees that we want to have as our tenants. And with that knowledge, that's how you de-risked it. The, the investment versus, um, oh, there's all sorts of growth going on in the Atlanta MSA. We're going to like get on the phones and start working brokers to find something to develop there. Um, your your investment approach was incredibly localized. And therefore- yeah, we're, we're always hyper Pacific uh, specific. We, you know, we know the neighborhood that we want. We know when we buy it, it has to be able to stand on its own as a rental property because it takes a few years in Seattle to get a building permit. So we wouldn't, you know, we bought the ugliest houses in the nicest neighborhoods we could afford. Mm -hmm. And to finance some of it, we started bringing on a business partner. And then he took, you know, up to 30 to 50% of the equity, but it was much easier than dealing with banks. So. I think it was the best decision we made. Right. So, so, all right. So let's talk about investors. So like in, in that example, um, you weren't syndicating yet. It sounds like it, it was like an, another partner who was a private yeah, capital like, partner. Yeah. Tenants how, in common. Yeah. How did, like, how did you find that person? Just somebody that we've known for a while. He watched us grow and watched us uh, rehabbing houses and watch us build a couple of townhouses. And then I was just having lunch with him one day talking about the bank loan and he starts scribbling on a piece of paper and he goes, I'll do it for that. <laughs> and I'm like, no, nah, I don't want your money. Right. Right. <laughs> I'll deal with the bank. So uh, it was interesting. Uh, once you kind of take a big step back, look at big picture view how much easier it is to not deal with construction draws. And right. I think it's worth giving up a part of the equity if you're looking at to develop properties. Right. And one of the things I'm thinking, uh, you know, I've been thinking, you know, since we first talked, you know, a few weeks ago and, and, you know, in this, in this um, call is that none of this happened fast. You didn't wake up and say, I want to be developing, you know, townhomes on Alki Beach in Seattle, which, you know, for our listeners is like a really spectacular place. And, um, you know, it was just kind of, you know, what, what can I do with my time and resources I have now? And then like, I'm, you know, there was a diligence, a repeated diligence over and over again that led to a lunch with this person who you had known before. And that person at that point in time was ready to offer something up to you. Yeah. And it, you know, so it's not like... You didn't go to the, you know, the yellow pages and say, you know, 1-800, um, you know, angel investor. No, no. Oh, no. I, yes. Um, I don't think we had a luxury to jump into something big right away. So we both had W2 jobs and there is a favorite saying of ours. It's what you do on your time off that makes you rich. So we literally were looking at stinky houses on our date nights and looking at different projects and walking through the construction sites and seeing, you know, which builder does what projects, what architect is doing what in our area and kind of starting with that. And then first project, Alan actually did complete remodel and then architect said, you know, you guys will be better off (laughs) just bulldozing bulldozing it Uh. over. So that's how the first project came along and we got our construction loan and um, built the first project we did. And then we kind of got hooked on that. Right. Yeah. Uh, new construction is a million times easier than remodeling a yeah. house, trying to level an old house and, you know, yeah. do a stud out remodel. It's just easier to just scrape right. and have two big shiny houses. But yeah. yes, yeah. it's a process. You're absolutely right. It doesn't happen overnight at all. All right. So yeah, we, yeah, we were ahead. doing a project every other year mm-hmm. at the start. And then it kind of just always ended up that way because the permit time in Seattle, it's it takes a lot of capital to get the permit. And then so it was hard for us to recover financially from every project, you know? Right. All right. So, I mean, one, I mean, so like I'm a big believer in learning by doing, 
Yeah. And uh, so like that, you know, that's, cl that's cl a clear message um, in, in, in your kind of story or progression. Shifting a little bit to your role as a, you know, kind of maybe say three, three perspectives, the perspective of a GP investing in value add apartments, the perspective of an LP investing in say value add apartments or built to rent. And then thirdly, just having, you know, your, your own professional network of other people doing kind of what you're doing. I'm wondering, have, do you think that there are kind of commonalities in what makes for a, you know, successful investment versus, you know, or conversely commonalities of what makes for a more challenging investment? Well, I think first talking about shift, I think the after development and owning investment properties, at least for me, it was a big mental shift going on the multifamily. Because first it's working hard. And I think going when you start growing, then you start looking into working smart and looking for the opportunities for your money to start working for you. Because if you know if you have a job, you'll be working for money till you die. And then you need to find ways to make your money work for you. So yes, yeah, so we started doing their multifamily, but we started first as limited partners. And that's exactly as your question, we started looking for common things, which projects were more successful, which GPs were more successful in running their projects and uh, what were the common things? Yeah, you go to meetup groups out of, you know, we had to travel to Texas or Arizona, wherever and you meet someone like Stephen Louie and he's just a solid guy with a really solid financial background. It's like, I don't know why you wouldn't want to team up with them, you know? And yeah, and he, then so we did a great investment for us. It was yeah. really quick, 23 months in and out. Right. Yeah. And I just, and then we yeah. looked in different markets and different projects. And I think one of the common denominators for successful GP was like the project matters, but I think who is running it is one of the most important criteria. So like you're batting on the jo jokey. Uh, to run, right. um, make the property successful. Um, and then locations always been crucial for us. Uh, if there is economic growth going in and what will sustain the project itself. Yeah. And um, so that's, I think that was the key for us. Yeah, the limited partners, we just, I like to go have dinner with people and get to know people. I don't want to just, exchange business cards and then give somebody money right right i kind of want to know them so i'd call people up some people would never call back so that right. was a decision yeah. uh, isn't i mean isn't it interesting how i mean and and i'm like i'm not uh, minimizing your comment about like location and the product and 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 you know kind of these these uh quantifiable metrics yeah right that keep you that, that create uh you know guardrails so like all so you're like we're in texas yeah. or we're in dallas fort worth we're not in you know you know just make something of anchorage alaska yeah and so like when a great like interesting thing comes up at investment in anchorage alaska you say no because that's not your criteria but yeah what, what, what i think is interesting is and, and you know, i hear this all the time i experience this is that the importance of just getting with somebody, you know, ideally in person, not over Zoom, but like, you know, you do what you can yeah. do and like getting to know them and relying on your gut or your intuition. Because as you were describing, Stephen, like, you know, you're, you're, you're like the words you use are like spot on. I use them as well, like solid, kind of mm -hmm. grounded. Yeah. And like in that, like for me, gives me a lot of confidence to then invest with him. And somebody yeah. else might want, you know, kind of... <laughs> you know, want to like resonate with somebody else. Yeah. That's okay. But it's interesting. I think how we're dealing with a lot of money, a lot of risk and our intuition is, is not to be um, minimized. Yeah, no, I agree. And uh, I, you know, in your gut, you just know in your gut, if someone's going to do the right thing when nobody's watching, I mean, right. I think most of us can figure that out within a couple of minutes of meeting somebody. Right. Yes, and, and for us, relationships been always yeah. so, like super important, and we'd rather go deeper than wider. Yeah, me too. People we have and their investors in our community as well. So that's kind of been probably the most yeah, important her, factor for us. She has a very successful real estate brokerage, and it's all 
referrals. Uh, yeah. if there's no advertising. It's just, yes. you know, families it's saying, my, my kid's moving out, wants to buy a house. Can yes. you help them? Right. So that's best. more for referrals now. It's like the parents are referring their kids, which is. That's a pretty good referral. Long, it's very humbling. Yeah. It's very humbling because you know people for a long time. Right. You're right. part of your life. Yes. All right. So let's, you know, a couple of questions on, on your outlook. So what is your outlook for 2023? Are you active uh, buyers, investors, or, you know, are you like, oh no, you know, the world's coming to an end. Um, and I'm exaggerating. So it, it, which, whatever your answer is, I didn't want to like kind of, you know, direct it. Well, we're optimistically cautious. Um, mm -hmm. and we still want to do projects, but we don't have any certain goals to like, increase the amount of doors by certain amount or do exactly our last year goal was to do five projects we did three three so um so we want to do projects in certain area with certain partners and um i think we still looking for opportunities yeah like we had far more passive deals than gp deals last year uh, we love investing passively in apartments uh yeah as far as gp i really think interest rates are going to come down i think this is going to be pretty short lived i personally don't think there'll be a huge recession uh i read the wall street journal about every day and that's about my only news source i don't watch cable news can't stand it keep it clean uh, i don't care what channel keep it, it is. clean it's good <laughs> yeah so i'm optimistic i i think the rates are going to stop going up they might go up one more time half a point and then it's going to be done yeah and then six months later i think they're coming back down yeah yeah all right all right final final couple questions we're uh, uh two questions we're, uh one each start with alan um so I've heard you talk about uh, the power of a made up mind. How is this different than kind of generically deciding to do or not do something? And lastly, how does one tap into what you're describing? There's a great podcast. I wish I could find it. It's by uh, Brian Buffini. I wish I knew his episode number, but this Marine talks about the power of a made up mind and he had some big things he had to do. And like, he couldn't swim, but he had to enter a triathlon. And he goes, I just made up my mind to teach myself to swim. He jumped in the lake and he swam a mile out. Then he had to turn around and swim a mile home. That's how he started swimming two miles. I guess when your prize is really great, what you're searching for really means something to you. Then the price you're willing to pay is really small, no matter what that price is, time, effort. Uh, I think you just like, I okay, I've struggled with weight. And once I just, instead of saying I want to weigh 200 pounds, you know, it could change that to I want to walk into a room and have people go, whoa, what happened to you? You look great. You lost a ton of weight. So... I think you have to reframe your goals to where they resonate with you and they mean something to you. Uh, you know, a lot of us want material things. If it resonates with you, the reason why you want it is big enough and you were hyper intentional. So like we have a boat, but we knew exactly what the boat was going to look like before we started shopping for one. So we didn't have to look at every boat on the market. It's the same thing with apartments, general partners. We know, exactly what we're looking for in a general partner, mm -hmm. a co a co GP. So that makes that easy. I think you just have to be intentional, know what you want, and then just make up your mind to go do it. I I think it's nothing but make up your mind to just go do it. It's not about a to-do list. And, you know, we all write goals, let's just do this, do that. Well, that's just a checklist or something. But uh it's about who you need to become to get to the next level. It's like, I didn't know anything about building a house. So I just went around to job sites and talked to people. And once I started meeting these general contractors, I'm like, if that guy can figure out how to do this, surely I can, because he's no genius. So 
I just need to become what you need to become to do what you want to do and go do it. Excellent. I, I don't know. It's, that's great. No, you, yeah. you, 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 that, you said a lot there. All right, Elena. Um, so I know that goals are very important to you and Alan. I'm going to come at this from a slightly different angle. Share with our listeners how goal setting has played a role in your marriage. Oh, it's huge. Um, and it's especially important to, to setting goals together. And for us, it's kind of been a very important part of our relationship. And we focus not only on goals financial, but for the goals for our relationship. Um, we have our date night scheduled, and it's in our goal list as well. Um, it We had set goals for raising our daughter and what our lifestyle will look like, um, where we want to spend time together. And then what things excite me and I do it on my own and what's important for Alan uh, for his time um, to grow and have fun and enjoy the life. So I think it's very important to be aligned together because um, if your spouse is not aligned in your long term goals and where you want to be, what you want to do, I think it's super hard to do it on your own. And it's proven us from time to time, depending on the careers, depending on uh, things we accomplished. Uh, and sometimes somebody is more focused on short-term part and somebody is more visionary and focus on the long-term. And it's not really about who is doing what and who is more important, but it's how it all aligns long-term and helps you get there together. And I think helps you grow together as well. That's great. I mean, yeah. you use the word alignment like several times and um, yes. that's, it. Yeah. that's it. We go off separately and we both write our own goals and then we go like a nice restaurant, really quiet, sit in the corner and we we swap each other's goals and we read them and we kind of laugh and chuckle. They're pretty much in line every year. And, you know, I I don't know. So I know so many people that handle money differently in relationships than we do and mm -hmm. it's just we've had a shared bank account since we were dating i think and it's just i don't know something yeah. we just do once again our alignment money, our, all, our, all our money goes into the same account so yeah all right uh elena allen thank you for coming on the show if listeners would like to get a hold of you what is the best way for them to do that Yes, um, they can reach to us uh, via email. It's info at andoverholdings.com. And if they have any questions about joining our investor community, um, they can share what interests they have and what information they would like to receive. We're also always happy to share information we have on the success strategies of building a long-term wealth avoiding taxes and creating passive cash flow. Uh, we have that information. We can email them as well. So um, yes, it's info at andoverholdings.com. And we are also um, always happy to connect on social media and other outlets as well. And that email address will be in the show notes. Uh, and for those listeners who uh, want to connect with me or be on the show, please feel free to shoot me an email at peter at verticalstreetventures.com or uh, reach out on LinkedIn. And as always, please consider subscribing to the show. And if moved, please leave a five-star review so we can continue to have terrific guests like Alan and Alina Neely share their insight with us. Thank you for wish, uh, listening and I wish you all a terrific week. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed the show, please go to iTunes and leave a rating and written review to help us grow and reach more listeners. Subscribe too, so you can get the latest episodes. Lastly, to stay updated, head on over to verticalstreetventures.com. If you're interested in learning more about what we do, you can schedule a call with our team on the website. Thanks again for joining us. Be sure to tune in next week for another episode.